Hello, my name is Dr Richard Fisher and I'm a consultant in intensive care at King's College Hospital in London and I'm a member of the BSC's Education Committee and today I'm uh, joined by Dr Graham Barker who's a consultant in intensive care and anaesthesia at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford and is also the lead for the BSC's ACE accreditation, so the Adult Critical Care ECHO uh, accreditation. Um, Graham, thank you very much for joining us today. Lovely to be here, thank you for the invite. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of critical care um, and acute specialty echo accreditations that are available through the BSC um, and talk about a little bit about the differences between them. Um, I think probably everyone who comes into echo has come from a slightly different um, sort of route into it, especially if you're coming not as an echocardiographer, but somebody working in an acute specialty. Um, so I think the first thing I'd like to ask you, Graham, is how did you get involved in echo? What was your own experience? Yeah, it's an interesting question, actually, because it's changed enormously during the brief time that I've been an echocardiographer. So as you said at the start, uh, by qualification, I'm an anaesthetic and intensive care consultant. Um, and I trained in echo because I was lucky enough that I did an echo fellowship as part of my intensive care training, where I had a day a week scanning with uh, echocardiography consultants from ICU for a year and then cardiology for a year. Um, and I did that and completed the adult level two accreditation process as it was then, because there were no critical care specific echo training programs. Um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to develop a high end level critical care echo skill to use in both sides of my job, but predominantly critical care. Um, and it really came around because it, it was about the same time that the focused echo courses were just starting to uh, begin. So feel and fate had begun to develop momentum, particularly uh, in European countries. Um, and more of us were becoming accredited in feel, but trying to find somebody who could supervise you, who understood the interpretation and the application and training of echocardiography and critical care was, was difficult because it was predominantly supervised by people from the cardiology community. Um, and then since then, I completed my level two accreditation, was appointed to a consultant job in uh, ICM. And in the meantime, ACCE was developed as an accreditation process within the BSE because the popularity of adult TTE as a diagnostic skill for intensive care clinicians was really building. But I think what we were recognising was that as a training process, there was stuff in there which was highly relevant for sonographers who would be dealing with the outpatient population and inpatient population of cardiology patients, which weren't as relevant to critical care. And there were perhaps a few areas of critical care echocardiography that would benefit from a, an emphasis or a focus as part of that accreditation process. Um, so such as volume responsiveness or cardiac output and changes in cardiac output to therapeutic interventions. Um, and so that's where the ACC committee was convened and that's why the, the qualification was created. Um, and I was appointed to chair the BSE ACC committee uh, four years ago um, and it's grown in linear fashion ever since then. Um, and then since then we've seen the introduction of level one by the BSE as well as uh, the next tier in focused echocardiography using transthoracic echo um, as an application for core acute clinicians and sonographers to try and make a rapid and structured assessment of the, the central circulation, but as an extension from the, the focused echo programs, which have become very established amongst not only the ICU community, but increasingly more and more clinical specialties, such as acute medicine, emergency medicine, and, and increasingly anesthesia. So, Graham, you're, you're absolutely right that the, uh, the landscape's changed over the last sort of probably 15 years, that sort of rough length of time, I think, is when, when these started to, to appear. Um, if you are if you're approached by a new trainee, so it's August now, you're approached by a new trainee who's just started in your department. They've got no previous echo experience and they want to they want to start. Where, where do you point them first? Um, yeah, it's a really, really common question, actually, that we get. We're a big echo centre. It's our primary cardiac output diagnostic and therapeutic uh, device that we use. And I think a lot of people see it being used and being used and making a difference to patients in real time. So we get a lot of people are very enthusiastic. We, we nearly always direct them towards um, the focused echocardiographic studies to start with. So FICE is the main thing that we, we suggest that people work towards. It's a great qualification, which gives you the diagnostic independence in a relatively structured and 
finite training program, which is very realistic within about three months of a supervised training post to independently be able to make a structured assessment of myocardial structure and function within a shock syndrome. Um, and it really helps with what we tend to term the hot scan. So the kind of acutely shocked patients where you're not quite sure whether they or what blend of volume resuscitation, inotropic or vasopressor therapy they need. Um, usually we find when somebody's completed FICE, they're absolutely desperate to go on and do higher level qualifications um, and they want to naturally extend those. Um, our advice is to usually go away and use it and use it for six months reliably for two reasons. Firstly, it gives you an idea of how much you're going to integrate it into your clinical practice. Um, but it also gives you the opportunity to try and independently maintain it as a clinical skill and see how feasible that is within the construct of your job. And if people remain enthusiastic, we tend to signpost them either to, to level one or ACCE. Um, uh, level one obviously being slightly quicker and easier to um, to achieve because the training isn't quite as as quantitatively um, heavy as ACCE is. Um, whereas those that really want to go to what we often term the colder scans, which are the kind of the more subtle interpretations of things like valvular or diastolic function, which can often be used in patients who've got slightly more subtle response to shock or, you know, possibly stuck on a ventilator and you're looking to try and see whether there's a cardiac reason that's either responsible or, or possibly exaggerating that. And then we find that they're the people who've filtered themselves out and are keen to invest the time that's required to do that, that ACCE qualification. You, you mentioned the time it takes to get these different accreditations. And I think, I think that's a really important um, issue that anyone who wants to start an accreditation understands the investment that it's going to take for them. Um, if, we, if we start with the level one, um, because that's one that I think personally, I, I tend to get my trainees to do that before they think about anything that's more involved. What's involved in the level one accreditation? What do people sign up for if they sign up for that? Uh, so it's like a lot, like all accreditation processes with the BSE, um, it's it's enshrined in an evidence base around quality of training as well as quantity of training. Um, and so what's really important is that you have a supervisor and or a mentor and there are subtle distinctions. Your supervisor needs to be a, a level two BSE accredited individual, whereas your mentor can possess the same qualification that you have. Uh, so, for example, a level one mentor can supervise a level one trainee but to be signed off you'll need to find a supervisor as well and that relationship's really important because it makes sure that you've got somebody who's your kind of quality zero reference if you like to make sure that what you're learning is both accurate and and sustainable and then that way if you learn well when you teach people you'll teach them well as well so you'll need to find individuals within your local hospital who have the desire and time and ability to supervise you um, and then once you've completed uh, FICE already, then your level one training would be 75 additional supervised or mentored scans, which are signed off by your by your supervisor. Um, and then in addition to that, you would collate that into a logbook, uh, which would be presented on an assessment day. And that assessment day is housed by the BSE and is run nationally uh, several times a year um, using examiners pulled from the level one and the ACCE committees. Um, and in that exam station, they will review your logbook and they'll look at the scans and they'll talk to you about it. And what they're doing is it's not really an exam, but they're examining your working knowledge of echocardiography and those scans that you've done and the inference that you've made from the reports that you've written to try and work out whether you're knowledge of and your application of echo in critical care is is accurate and functional um, and then there's a practical assessment so the practical assessment involves um, using a simulator to obtain images on a mannequin to examine your practical ability to echo and then finally there are kind of standardized loops which are played which are very standard um, and are used as a subject for a clinical discussion to make sure that your interpretation of some set views in a appropriate clinical situation are in keeping with how the, the committee who run the exam um, think that they should be interpreted. So it's a nice structured and very, very objective assessment process, which allows you to have a quantitative degree of training followed by a qualitative assessment where you're expected to demonstrate the practical skills that you've developed and your diagnostic interpretation skills. And I think that's really important because I think as you move through the tiers of echocardiographic qualifications, what you tend to do is 
focused echocardiographers become very popular. A lot of our trainees are FICE trained, but it's not uncommon as a level two sonographer in my unit that I'm presented with scans that other people have done. And I'm expected to interpret just those images with a moderate or sometimes a minimal amount of clinical history. And I think it's really important that you have a way that you can apply the knowledge and skills that you've learned through that training program to a variety of clinical situations. And I think that that training program does that very reliably and very reproducibly. One of the things that you touched on when you talked about that was finding a supervisor. And we know that for learning to echo, finding a supervisor is re repeatedly highlighted as a stumbling block, block for many people. Um, how do people go about finding a, a supervisor, first of all, for level one? Yeah, excellent question. And the answer to most echocardiographic issues within critical care is usually the BSC website. So certainly the BSC houses a, uh, an, uh, a site on their webpage for both level one and ACCE. And there are links on there to try and find local registered supervisors and mentors that you can use. Um, every department, um, certainly in critical care and cardiology will have a nominated lead for echocardiography. So if you're already working in a healthcare establishment and finding that individual may well signpost you to not only people who have the requisite qualifications, but may well have the time to be able to do it. And as a department, we've recognised the, the volume of work that this brings, but that you know, with repeated training, you develop expertise at doing it. And that means that you can train people better, but also more efficiently. And so we have, as a department, appointed people who are leads for level one, and for level two scanning training so that when we get novices who are interested in echocardiography, we can direct them or triage them accordingly to the right people. One of, obviously I run a lot of courses for echo um, and often get approached by people at those courses who are in a, in, working in a trust or working in a part of the country where they don't have uh, as much access to an established system like, like you have at Oxford. Um, and one of the places where we thought we can direct them to is to the BSE regional reps. So on the website as well, you've got a list of um, the whole country is covered by regional representatives from the BSE. And if I think if trainees are in a situation whereby they, they are getting no joy. They really, really want to learn the skill. They really want to develop it, but they're finding that their trust is not able to provide them with supervisors. Um, I think the, the place that I would suggest they go is, is the regional reps and they can find them on the website. Uh, so Graham, I'm aware that both you and I are intensivists and um, I'm conscious of the fact that we might accidentally give out the idea that this is something that's only for intensive care trainees and the intensive care medics. Um, and obviously that's not the case. Um, and training in echocardiography at all levels is, is important and going to be important going forward for people working in lots of acute specialties, um, but also not just doctors, but also allied health professionals. So nurses, people, uh, paramedics working pre-hospital. Um, what, what advice do you have for people coming from, from different um, sort of areas, both within medicine and, and without medicine? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I'd certainly always think that intensivist sounds more like a personality uh, disorder rather than a clinical specialty. Um, but you're right, it's, it's, it's become a, a central clinical tool in, in critical care medicine. Um, but I think um, one of the greatest successes of uh, resuscitative or core echocardiography is reflected by the rapid development of qualifications for point of care echo in other specialties. So certainly outside of intensive care medicine, um, the Royal College of Physicians have developed a point of care program, which includes focused echocardiography with famous, their focused acute medical ultrasound. Um, the Intensive Care Society have a wide range of diagnostic point of care skills housed within the FUSIX, the, uh, the focused ultrasound in intensive care qualification portfolio. Uh, again, reflecting the importance of, of echocardiography as, as one of the model, uh, modules that they use. Um, and certainly within our intensive care department, we have non-clinicians. So we have um, uh, non, we have sonographers and we have physiotherapists who are accredited in uh, focused echocardiography, which they use as part of their, their clinical practice on a regular basis. And I think one of the one of the greatest things that I like working with the BSE on the ACCE committee is the, the heterogeneous group that's made up from uh, and that we have sonographers and doctors working on the same committee, all with the same shared vested interest and knowledge base within echocardiography, but with a very subtle difference in our outlook, which brings, I think, a very versatile qualification to the hospital because of that group of people that have been involved in its design and maintenance. Um, so someone's done the BSE level one and they have, they, they've 
totally uh, revolutionized their clinical practice. They use it all the time uh, and they think it's fantastic. And they are thinking about going for the, uh, for the ACE accreditation. So, so what's involved in that? What's the, what's the difference between the two and what, what does that involve? Uh, so ACE is a natural extension of level one, um, but it's a broader horizon. And as a result, you need more time in order to be able to encompass the, the detail that's included in this uh, different process. Um, so it's a larger logbook, it's 250 scans, and those scans need to be performed initially under the direct supervision of your mentor and or supervisor and countersigned. But equally, there's a, a requirement from the BSE that 150 of those scans need to be independently reported because as we both know as echocardiographers, um, you're developing an independent practical ability where you generate an image, but a large part of it is interpreting that image in the context of that clinical situation that you're scanning that patient in. And this training process, the process is not only designed to teach you to how to practically do a scan, but also generate that context specific report. And so there's a requirement for that gradual transition from novice to independent practitioner. Um, and in order to try and make ACCE a bespoke qualification for ICU, there is a different pre-specified list of pathologies that are required in the logbook in order to reflect what we think are probably the most important echocardiographic diagnoses that you'll use your diagnostic sonography skills uh, when scanning that ICU population. So 25 of them need to be an assessment of your left ventricular systolic function. You need to see the rare but recognised um, so, for example, prosthetic valves uh, or um, pericardial diseases or effusions. And so there are a few pre-specified um, uh, mandatory requirements for the composition of your logbook. And all of this is set out in the accreditation pack, which is available on the BSE website. When you've completed your logbook, which needs to be completed within a 24 month period, uh, that will be taken with you to an assessment day at the BSE. What you also need to complete during that time scale is the written exam. So the written exam is a multiple choice examination, uh, which is a non-negatively marked uh, single choice MCQ, which is delivered in a variety of centres through Pearson View up and down the country now and runs twice a year. Um, and it's one half of the assessment process for ACCE. But the other half of the assessment process for ACCE is the video exam. And again, this is a similar but more structured approach to the um, interpretation of echocardiographic images where there are 10 cases of echo loops which are presented with clinical vignettes which have four to five multiple choice questions uh, which candidates are expected to complete in the same sitting and the two of them form the, the kind of knowledge assessment of echocardiography because they allow you to assess the whole breadth of the um, syllabus. And the final stage of assessment for ACCE is the video cases. Um, and so that's done at the practical assessment day, um, which is done at the same time as level one. Um, and it has a very similar format where there's an assessment where somebody goes through your logbook with you um, and discusses any interesting or unusual cases that you may have. There is a practical station again where you demonstrate your practical abilities as a sonographer. Um, and then you need to do five video cases as you would need to do if you were doing adult. TTE accreditation rather than the ACCE accreditation. But we're quite specific about the video cases in that the video cases have to be performed in ICU. And one of them needs to be one where you're looking for volume responsiveness. So that's where you're looking for sonographic features to suggest that delivery of intravascular fluid would improve somebody's shock syndrome. Um, and the other one needs to be an assessment of somebody or a calculated cardiac output. Um, uh, sonographic assessment and what we're looking for there is is good quality but clinically relevant echoes um, from real patients in ICU and we have intensive care clinicians and sonographers who run this assessment day and there's usually a relatively interactive discussion around the case and how those images influenced patient decision making and how other images may well have altered your decision making. Um, if that's successfully uh, completed, then you're accredited with the BSE in ACCE. Um, and then you drop into the same um, mandatory requirements from the BSE 
in order to maintain your echocardiographic qualifications with a BSE, which is completion of a certain amount of BSE points uh, through either attendance of either online courses, regional or national courses, um, and attendance at examiner's day. So what we try and do is pull people in on the ACC qualification um, to be examiners, to get them involved with that community nationally so that they can assist in the development of the next generation of ICU echocardiographers. Yeah, I think that's really important. It's what you're, you're training people, not just to perform a clinical skill, but then to be the trainers of the future. And, and nothing makes you understand a topic like having to teach it. Agreed. Yeah. Another thing that I'm going to pick up on, um, uh, Graham, is you mentioned about the fact that the uh, ACE accreditation and the examination process in many ways looks quite similar to the level two accreditation that you might take if you were a consultant cardiologist who is an expert in imaging or if you were a healthcare physiologist working in the department there. And I think for me, that was really important. When I did my level two accreditations, I knew that I had done exactly the same level of rigor of, of exam, of logbook process as the cardiologist that I was going to then be talking to. And it, it gave me the confidence that I felt that I was in a position to go and have those conversations because I'd done exactly the same sort of um, depth of knowledge that they had had to acquire and I'd had to demonstrate and, and maintain those skills in the same way that they had so that really meant I felt like I was I was welcome at that table. Absolutely it has really helped so certainly in my establishment the development of echocardiography within ICU has forged really strong working links with the cardiology department in general but certainly within the imaging department so amongst the sonographers and the imaging cardiologists and there are wonderful examples out of ours where cardiology registrars or consultants will bring scans down to ICU for review if they know that some of the ACCE level two sonographers and clinicians are working within the unit and certainly at the point of care so when in the emergency department um, when we and the cardiologists are with for example an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest or a cardiogenic shock um, then there's a lot of overlap between the use and delivery of echocardiography and kind of shared use of those images um, but an equal and mutual level of respect of each other's diagnostic abilities because the BSE is a, an environment where all different specialties are housed within one common training program and it doesn't matter if you're a cardiologist or a intensivist or a um, an acute physician, that qualification is a generic qualification and that standardised level of training means that it can be equally respected regardless of which direction you come at that scenario from. All of everything you've just described, it sounds like a lot of work and I, and I can attest to that, but it is, it is quite a lot of work and I don't think it's necessarily for everybody. Um, how much work is involved in obtaining the ACCE and, and therefore who do you think it's aimed at and who should be trying to, to, to do that? Yeah, it's, I think it's an excellent question. And the first thing we say to people when they're embarking on ACCE is just to recognise how much of a commitment we need. So we have a fellows programme where we train our ACCE uh, candidates. We usually appoint them for a two-year programme. Um, and it's not necessarily two years because you need two years to do 250 scans. Most people will far exceed that number of scans. But in order to spend the time that you need to learn the application of that echocardiography and the time that you need to obtain the composition of your logbook and successfully complete your assessment process, so that's the written and the video exam, and collate your video cases, means that it's very achievable within two years. Most people do it within about 18 to 20 months, and it's nice to have that bit of buffer room around it. But the way that people achieve that is by not only working in an intensive care department where there's a very, very integrated echocardiographic process already. So not only the hardware, but the number of clinicians who are equally accredited who can work as a mentor or a supervisor. But those guys also get a day a week of dedicated time working one on one with either a supervisor or mentor, either in an outpatient or an inpatient capacity. There's dedicated time to develop that skill. And I think my advice to anybody considering embarking on ACCE would be to make sure that you have a supervisor before you start because it takes a huge amount of commitment from that supervisor and I think it's important that that relationship is established right at the start and everybody knows that exactly what people are trying to work towards because of the amount of effort that's required on both parts. Um, the quickest we've had somebody train is probably about 16 to 18 months. But I think you know, on average, 20 to 24 months seems a realistic way of consistently being able to develop that skill. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and 
definitely i think if, if you're in a position to do it as part of a fellowship or something with some protected time that that's going to make it much more achievable I, I think it's quite tricky to achieve without having worked your own personal timetable in such a way that you've got time that you've protected to, to develop that skill definitely and it's been it's been brilliant to watch acce develop as a qualification on the map where mentors and supervisors have popped up all over the map now um and when we train people, we're fortunate that we have seven ICU consultants who possess level two qualification. And we train them as a hybrid process. So people will move around between trainers because we recognize that different people teach things differently. And um, being taught by a variety of people makes you a much, much more well-rounded um, sonographer. But we also send trainees to the outpatient echo department and we have a good working link with cardiology where several of our cardiology consultants will work with our trainees even though they're developing ACCE because we recognize the value and importance of that that multidisciplinary approach when we're training people um, and how everybody teaches things um, differently depending on their case mix and what their exposure is. So you've obviously got a, an established system now at Oxford whereby you get trainees coming through your fellowship programme and they achieve the ACE accreditation during that period. What, what do people then go on to do with it? What do people do with ACE once they have it? It's still a relatively novel qualification. So I think for the people moving to departments where um, there isn't an established ECHO programme, then I think it takes there's a lot of responsibility on the individual joining that department to help them understand exactly what's required to be able to develop and maintain that diagnostic and training program that a lot of units are looking for. Certainly, I've noticed over the last four or five years, increasingly jobs are appearing within the intensive care community with a pre-specified mention in the job description for formal echo accreditation and a certain level of training. Um, and as chair of the ACCE, we have guidance on what kind of reflection that needs in a job plan for an individual to be able to maintain the kind of activity in order to deliver the quality of education and the quantity of clinical activity required by the BSE to maintain that accreditation. Um, Accreditation, as a lot of BSE members will know, is, again, specified through BSE um, in that you need to maintain uh, or accrue a certain amount of points in a five year cycle. Um, and some of that can be reflected by the volume of echocardiographic activity. So if you do a certain amount of scans per year, you can direct a certain amount of points towards that. But there's also a cap on that and there's a mandatory requirement to attend um, uh, a range of CPD activities. Um, so they can be international or national meetings, they can be internal uh, cardiology meetings, they can be local or regional BSE events. And certainly in COVID, we've seen a real spring up with um, web-based echocardiographic meetings, um, which are recognised by the BSE as well, which all contribute towards the ongoing maintenance of that, of that um, accreditation uh, that you have with the BSE. From a clinical perspective, um, I think we're increasingly we're seeing more and more departments become integrated with echocardiography as a fast, reproducible, non-invasive and reliable way of triaging patients with shock and having direct impacts on therapeutic decisions, which can then be repeated um, as required to help sculpt ongoing care. Um, and we're starting in the evidence base to see the clinical impact that that's having on outcome of patients who are in intensive care departments where there's a heavy preponderance for echo skill. And obviously that's a very difficult thing to tease out. There isn't a randomized control trial yet, much as I wish there was. Um, but I think that there's increasingly retrospective observational data that's reinforcing the, the role that echo has in the management of acutely unwell patients uh, in hospital. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of it. And we, I guess it's up to you and I to, to, to demonstrate that to, to anyone who might possibly not believe us. Um, okay, Graham, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm, I hope and I'm sure that there will be people who've seen this who are now inspired to go off and, and either start from the beginning or take what they've already done and, and develop that further to go and do level one and, and maybe even become the, the clinical leads of the future, which we, we, we definitely, definitely need uh, by getting the ACE accreditation. Um, thank you very much for your time and I'm sure I'll see you again later soon. Looking forward to it. Really good to catch up, Richard. Cheers. Thanks, Graham.